Thanks very much. Our two speakers have provided us with a, a rich diet of issues to think about and also uh, been very disciplined, so we've got plenty of time to do it. Um, just to remind you of the rules of the road as far as the Q&A session is concerned, um, please uh, raise your hand if you uh, have a question uh, and wait for the microphone. Uh, please identify yourself so that we all know what acts you're grinding. Um, please also keep your questions brief so that we can uh, get through as many questions as possible. And could you also uh, make it clear um, who you're directing your question at, either Sarah or, or Paul? Okay, over to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The floor is open. Uh, there's one over there. There's two over there. There's what, what? Is that the microphone over there, I think. The microphone is waving at us. <laughs> oh, really? Ah, yeah. oh, right, sorry. Okay, we shift over there. It's, the visibility it's here is, is really hard to see, I'm afraid. Carry on. Um, my question, uh, sorry, my name is uh, Lieutenant Commander John Potter. My question is for Professor Percy. Um, I guess uh, just in your uh, last moments um, in your presentation, you were talking about the problems of uh, navies and dealing with police issues. Mm. Uh, I guess I would first say that um, neighbours have a great deal of utility across the whole spectrum of conflict, of course, so I mean, they're not designed for that work. But in the absence of police resourcing to take on that task, I mean, who else would do that? Uh, navies have always combated piracy, um, you know, back to the days of sail, uh, and you know, possibly even back to the days of uh, you know, um, uh, rowing uh, you know, around the Mediterranean. Um, so I just you know, wonder who else you would see that would take on that role. Um, well, I, th I think that's exactly right, and I hope I didn't give the impression that I didn't think that navies should be doing it at all. I think my worry is how much have we thought about the fact that navies are doing it, because navies have, have countered piracy forever and ever, but not as much in recent years. So is our apparatus correct for doing it? Are there ways, if we are going to have navies take on their, this role, because you're quite right, I don't, I don't see that there are very many other people who could do it. Are we equipped the right way to do it? Have we thought through the policy consequences of doing it? And are there ways that we can do it better? I think those are the important questions. And also, I think the costliness is a, is a big, big issue. I mean, I think in my presentation on Monday, I worked at that per incident, the cost of countering piracy is in the order of, oh gosh, I think piracy as a whole costs about vast quantities of money. I can't remember my numbers off the top of my head a year, but per attack, that number has gone up because, of course, piracy attacks in Somalia have gone down. So are there less expensive ways we can think of, of doing it that maybe involve different types of Navy approaches or maybe don't involve Navy approaches at all? It's hard to see how in the Indian Ocean case, though, given the lack of capacity in the neighborhood, that it would be any other way. Uh, my name is Harrison Palmer. Uh, I noted Paul Dibb's comment about how uh, much of uh, the ADF's acquisitions that are coming up will be, don't really have plausible justification. I'm reminded about uh, the British military establishment's response to Vidal Hart's uh, arguments of building the tank back in the interwar period. Uh, should, we, should we be concerned that there's a similar culture happening in the modern day ADF? Like, are there uh, vested interests or are there uh, people who are uh, so attached to precious traditions that they're not looking towards the future in terms of what really we strategically need? Uh, I'm just wondering, do you assess this as being a cause of concern for the ADF or modern military establishments? The, the way in which, in my experience, uh, force structure decisions are made are naturally incredibly complex. They involve risk management because no strategy is risk-free and governments need to understand that. And of course, when push comes to shove, they involve huge amounts of money. I mean, you know, a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, you know, sooner or later you're up against extremely serious money, the sorts of figures I mentioned. Um, 
I used to chair the Force Structure Committee when I was Deputy Secretary with the Vice Chief of the Defence Forces, my deputy, and the Service Chiefs or their deputies in that committee. And the other part of my portfolio was uh, Australia's defence intelligence collection and analysis, including the equivalent of GCHQ, and the issue of strategic policy. Frankly, those latter elements are the easier part. They're not easy, but intelligence assessment and inputs and developing strategic policy are if you've got the right sort of people, and we do have the right sort of people, by the way, they're relatively straightforward. It's the jump from intelligence and strategic risk analysis to force structure priorities and determinants where the vested interests, and they're not just military, they are, of course, the people who are the warriors um, naturally need the best equipment. The problem is that often, um, the last 10% of performance of any advanced military equipment accounts for a very serious part of the total cost. And I think what we're really, really bad at is not only assessing, you know, are these submarines we're going to acquire going to cost 10, 20, or 30 billion dollars? And that, of course, depends on size, range, endurance, weapon system, combat system, sensors, and so on. But we're, in my view, and I stand corrected on this, I think we're poor, and I think the DMO is poor, with its $10 billion annual budget, at assessing the through life sustainment costs. They are the real costs. I mean, the rule of thumb is, that particularly with advanced high technology equipment, the through life support costs, maintenance and so on, is two to three times the cost of the acquisition. So just let's say for argument's sake, the 12 new submarines would be about $30 billion acquisition. Well, through the life of those submarines, 30 plus years, uh, you're looking at another 60 to 90 billion, and before you know where you are, guess what? You've just gone clean over 100,000 million dollars. And the opportunity costs of that for any government in terms of health, education, disability insurance, dare I say, universities, uh, are not trade-offs that I think governments are good at. I think we're getting better but the answer to your question is, I don't see sort of, you know, dark plots uh, in these decision-making processes, but I do see in our current defense bureaucracy, it's always been the case, a ponderous bureaucracy, both civilian and military, and it's getting worse. And do you remember I said that the running costs of the day-to-day -day running costs of the defense material organization at about $850, $900 million a year is as much as the entire budget of the Department of Foreign Affairs to run our entire foreign policy and diplomacy overseas. And there's something wrong there, Jeffrey. Mm. Mm. Okay. In, in. Uh, good morning. Uh, Drew McKinney, RANC Worthiness Board and also ENS International in industry. Um, I wanted to resonate, uh, Professor Dibb, on your, on your opening comments about resourcing and uh, the required level of uh, investment capability required in, in the north. Um, in my dealings with both defence and industry, I'm detecting a level of frustration about lack of integrated approaches, about uh, uh, shortfalls in, um, in multi-portfolio buy-in in commitment of resources and effort for our security aims. Um, how might we do better to reframe our defence and maritime strategy to gain required government investment and industry support in uh, a, a broader multi-portfolio fashion outside the defence portfolio? And are you focusing particularly on the North? Um, no, it's not just the North. I, I know that in the submarine world, for example, there are elements of of industry and infrastructure in the south, of nation building, capability building. Yeah. But within the industry forums I've been involved with, there's a certain uh, frustration that defence and security strategy aims are being stymied by lack of integrated approaches and commitment in government in enabling portfolios like trade, infrastructure, transport. Okay. Um, you need to understand I'm no longer in government and. Uh, uh, so that's a qualification. I think by and large in the national security realm, uh, since I left uh, government, uh, the 
whole of government approach, it's a phrase I hate, you know, whole of wholeness, um, it is a lot better than it used not to be in the uh, intelligence, national security, defense, and foreign policy. But on the industry side, and just let me declare a, a conflict of interest so you know where I'm coming from, uh, the Australian Industry Group commissioned me uh, early this year to write their submission to the Minister, uh, Stephen Smith, on the future of defence industry in this country. And by the way, that report is on the website, and I don't own it. I wrote it, and then they made changes, and some of which I might have cared for and some of which I might not. <laughs> but by and large, it was an easy process. I sat with the primes of all the... Uh, the CEOs of all the primes and the SME representatives, and I locked myself away at the university in the month of January, which Sarah would know, is there was only me in the building, Sarah, <laughs> and it was absolutely beautiful. Um, when you read that, you'll see that I've been through every defense industry chapter of every white paper since 76. I've been through every ministerial report on defense industry, um, Bronwyn Bishop, um, uh, uh, Brendan Nelson, um, Greg Combay, and it is a depressing story. Uh, I know there are views about defense industry, but the fact is, if we are to be more self-reliant, not self-sufficient, but more self-reliant, we need indigenous capabilities here. There are limits, we're not gonna build aircraft, but we are building warships and so on. I know there are judgments about the opportunity costs of that, and we need better and a more informed and balanced debate. We need to be able to change equipment even some of the equipment we get from our closest friends and allies, as some of you know, doesn't necessarily operate in the different um, salinity, uh, sonar environment, radar environment, infrared environment uh, in, our, uh, in our north. I think the issue of industry is one where governments need to decide, as they are with the motor car industry, do we want one or don't we? And stop messing around and I'm sick of hearing governments of both persuasions say they're going to level load the, um, the, the orders so there's no valleys of death, you know. They're going to establish strategic priorities, which I've been working on on and off for 20 years. And we should have a set of strategic priorities for industry, you know. And let me name some. You heard me say anti-sonar, radars, you know, uh, signal processing, um, uh, c combat system development. Mm? So look, uh, it's not a good reply, but there is an issue, frankly, and I noticed uh, uh, Minister Johnston uh, uh, on Monday here, and I've been uh, impressed by his attendance at uh, this conference and at other functions in the last three days. He's criticized the previous government for having a distant defense relationship with industry, and Stephen used to, Smith used to say he was not the Minister for Defense Industry, and you know what he was saying. But however, S uh, Senator Johnston says, they're going to have a partnership agreement. Well, we'll see, because I've heard that before. There's a question over there on the left. Uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, this. Uh, good morning, Commander Guy Blackburn. Um, for Emeritus Professor Dibb, um, you define for us the Indo-Pacific region, you define for us our immediate neighbourhood, but you use the term our region to include places like Korea, Southeast Asia, South Pacific, um, the term our region seems to lead a little bit to game theory, both <laughs> on both tracks of dialogue. Uh, my question to you is, what do you define as our region in a time of fiscal austerity? It depends whether you're looking at it from a foreign policy, national security, or defense point of view, and those obviously overlap. But as a former defense planner, I tend to think, unlike foreign policy people, who wave their hands about and don't realize the cost of the wave, um, I do some work for them, so it's all right. Um, I tend to think in terms of what is the primary force structure determinant? Let me repeat that. What is the primary force structure determinant for the ADF? And it's this. The defense of Australia, which means focusing on the north and our northern approaches, sea, air, and so on. Bases, facilities, weapon systems are optimized for operating in that, you know, unique signature environment in the north. And we've got to do better at that, and this government, I believe, is, is saying that. The second part is, it's our immediate neighborhood in Southeast Asia, but as a, as a primary operational area, f the force structure determinants must adjust now 
to the Indian Ocean, but not all of it. I mean, really, for a defense force of 59,000, do we actually think you know, we can manage the whole of that ocean? And from my point of view, there is no such thing as a single strategic entity called the Indo-Pacific. And I had a bit of a hand in the 2013 white paper where we got some qualifications into it as an emerging, nascent concept. So if the primary operational area is going to be the Eastern Indian Ocean, and it's clearly got to go out beyond Cocos Islands, the whole of the Southeast Asia, including the South China Sea, the Pacific, South Pacific out to at least Fiji, and the Southern Ocean where we have major territorial claims and issues, that, as I've said, is about 20% of the Earth's surface. I mean, is that a challenge for a defense force of 59,000? I think so. Now, that doesn't mean to say that from time to time, when governments of the day make decisions for, let me be frank, token military contributions to alliance operations at distance, that we might not have to make some adjustments to the kit. And we've done that, you know, IED stuff and so on. But the primary force structure determinants and the discipline of the decision making in defense should be on the defense of, of Australia, broadly interpreted, and the region I've, de I've just described. Now, we may be involved in some situation in North Asia or the Middle, Middle East again, but that should not drive the force structure. I have um, three questions already lined up. First, second, third. Thank you, sir. My name is Captain Bill Miller from U.S. Pacific Fleet Plans and Policy. And I have a question in terms of the uh, agreements on avoiding incidents at sea. I'm involved in the Western Pacific Naval Symposium's code for unalerted encounters or unplanned, according to the changes that we are going to be proposing at the next uh, symposium. Um, and I'm wondering, it, what is the best forum for advancing uh, multilateral agreement at sea? Because I'm aware of several efforts. Uh, ours with WPNS has been uh, ongoing uh, for uh, quite a while, has existed for 10 years. And then there's some other ones that are beginning as well. Yeah. Uh, and which is the best forum to give it the right amount of gravitas and to get it out there and get it used? Yeah. By the way, I'd like to have a discussion with you afterwards, if you don't mind, because I'm interested in the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, and I'm acutely aware I may be missing some information. You know, I don't have 2,000 staff working for me any longer. <laughs> <laughs> There's me, Paul Dibb, end of story. Um, I think I'm aware that in the, that dreadful acronym, the ADMM+, plus, yeah. isn't it awful, that's right. that a lot of people think that's where the progress could be made. That's where, for the first time, defense ministers of, 27, uh, of, the, of, of the ASEAN group and the ASEAN Regional Forum are meeting. I think they're now meeting, is it every two years? It used to be every three years. They've had a meeting this year. And that that should be the professional area where defense ministers and their advisors, people like you, should be able to develop it. And I think there's some strength in that. I've got one qualification, and please, people in uniform, forgive me for saying this. This is not just a technical naval matter. This is a matter of high policy. This is a matter of high policy, because we're trying to avoid the use of force either by accident or by design. And I think the risks are palpable right now in the East China Sea, um, uh, the South China Sea, and other places. Um, and some of it, by the way, will involve allies of the United States, like just look at Japan and South Korea and Dr. Takashima. I mean, really, really. Um, I don't think my personal experience is, and I was in on the ground with the ASEAN Regional Forum when Gareth Evans was foreign minister to provide him with some documentation about confidence building. And we actually, Gareth and, and I actually proposed in 1994 avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement. And here we are, you know, 20 years later, uh, and we've gone nowhere. I think the ARF and ASEAN can't handle that sort of stuff. The East Asia Summit is where the throw weight is, and they may be able to handle it. But my bet is that the ADMM Plus might be the way to go. And my experience is in the ARF expert now at persons group is I've tried for five of the seven years to get a discussion about this subject, and certain countries have ruled me out of order. I can't even get a discussion. 
And, and since I'm still holding the mic, I'm going to quick follow up. <laughs> um, do you feel, though, that it seems like from your comments that this needs to be a regional as opposed to a, uh, a you know, worldwide? I'm, I'm aware of some efforts that are trying to make this a worldwide huh. uh, approach. Do you think it's better to focus on the regional? I do. Uh, you may well be better informed. My instinct is we've got, we, we've got to be careful not to bite off more than we can chew. I think some other views are that we should just go bilateral, bilateral. Why can't the Americans have such an agreement based on the Soviet one or the Japanese-Russian one with China? Why can't the ROK, for heaven's sake, have one with Japan? Um, and I'd be interested in any views others have on that. My instinct is it's serious enough in our region, this quintessential maritime region, where you know half the world's maritime trade, you know, you know all the figures better than me. Uh, I mean. I think two-thirds of our exports go through the South China Sea or just to the east of it. So I think multilateral, and my bet is, uh, and I stand, as I say, corrected on this, the ADMM plus, this will be a test for them. Can they come up with something concrete or yet more mm. talk shops, more mm. endless talks without making decisions about which, frankly, the IRF is really good at? You've been very patient over there, so over there, please. Thank you very much. Um, James Dedarian um, from the Center for International Security Studies, University of Sydney. And um, the question is directed to Sarah, who I think rightly points out that academic institutions notoriously lag behind changing world events, particularly security ones. We need multidisciplinary approaches and multilateral responses. But my question really is, what happens when you begin to securitize some of these global issues? Does it inevitably lead to a militarization of them? And by that I mean, if you have a blurring of you know, the military and policing on a landmass, meaning a nation state, you do have some judi judicial constraints. In the United States, posse comitatus, even though it's been eroded by 9-11. Um, but on the high seas, you don't have those norms, those regimes. And we just saw a case where a, a Navy believed it was its right, its obligation, to go in and snatch civilians from another state, you know, um, before they've been, you know, properly probable caused. Um, and they're right now floating in a brig somewhere in the high seas, and we don't know what norms and regimes are constraining extrajudicial behavior. So my question to you is, if you do securitize, militarize in the high seas, what kind of constraints that nation states have put in place, constitutional, judicial ones, do you see operating? Well, I think that, I mean, I think that unfortunately, once you securitize things on the seas, a militarized approach becomes almost inevitable because how else are you going to deal with something which occurs on the high seas? I think it's not quite right to say that there's a complete absence of judicial or legal mechanisms because, of course, the UN law of the seas is quite, it's a very robust form of international law. and. It doesn't necessarily speak directly to some of those issues, but it does provide an enormous amount of guidance. And actually, if you look at the way laws shape behavior, every single maritime actor in the world is heavily influenced by the law of the sea, just by the division between exclusive economic zone, territorial water, high seas. So, and people who are operating at sea are often highly aware of those constraints. I think the example you bring up is a particularly interesting one because it may be, and I'm not a maritime law expert, but I suspect it's an area in which the law doesn't say anything, but the law on piracy, for example, says an enormous amount about when and where and how you might go about doing these things. Ewan Graham. Uh, thank you, Chair. Ewan Graham, RSIS, Singapore, and um, formerly a student at SDSC when um, Paul was head. Um, my question goes primarily to Paul, um, but if Sarah wants to have a, a comment on it, then um, please, by all means. Paul, I, I just invite you to um, relate the capability side Paul, if I could ask you to relate the, the capability side of, uh, uh, of your presentation with the engagement part. Um, I suspect that the capabilities, uh, it, it maybe an unintended consequences, may drive the type of naval engagement that navies do. The ADF is undergoing a major uh, change. Um, certainly, if the submarines happen, that's, that's going to rule out conven many conventional types of, uh, of naval diplomacy. But I'm thinking specifically of the, the LHDs uh, and the comparison in a way with, um, with the United States in a, in a sense which is going the opposite direction from in, 
tools of naval engagement from big ships down to smaller ships. In Singapore, we've got the LCS, which is there. The LCS is very much, I think, uh, uh, designed as a sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a boat that can do a lot of um, naval engagement uh, around Southeast Asia and increase the range of um, partners that you can engage with. And it strikes me with the LHDs, that's also going to, in a way, uh, predispose the kind of partners and the kind of exercises and the type of naval diplomacy that Australia is going to engage in in future. So just your thoughts on how the uh, capability side relates to the engagement. I'm probably going to give you an unreconstructed um, answer. Um, in the end, the Defence Force is about fighting. It's warriors. Uh, that doesn't mean to say I don't recognize that there are different requirements uh, in the current and foreseeable era, but we live in a part of the world where although I've stressed we've been at peace for a long time and I really do stress that we need to think more about managing the peace and the role of the ADF which I went through in the latter part of my talk. But in the end, how you buy military equipment and the priority you give for a small country, for a small defense force with such large territorial uh, responsibilities, and in a region where there are no arms control and disarmament agreements, unlike in the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States, there are no nuclear weapons counting rules, there is no open skies agreement, there is no conventional arms control agreements, and there is no naval instance at sea agreement. So, prudent militaries, including ours, will hedge by getting capabilities that primarily, when push comes to shove, must be war fighting. I take your point about submarines. They're not brilliant at diplomacy, are they? Uh, neither should they be. Although, as I think some of the speakers earlier this week have stressed, the very fact that people know you've got a submarine and in our case, submarines, we are the only country in the world other than the United States that has uh, American combat system and American weapons on board, and that will give us a decisive regional edge compared with the still limited capabilities in our region. Now, of course, uh, particularly naval capabilities are multi-role, and uh, it's not to discount how we use our Air Force, including, you know, the C-17s in uh, the earthquake in Japan, where where I was at the time of that earthquake, or the use of our army in nation building uh, and um, situations in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. But I think you guys in the Navy uh, have a primary role in this quintessential maritime environment, and it may be that we should look at some additional issues with regard to um, the multi-rolling of platforms. And I was taken by your reference to the um, I think you made a reference to the littoral combat ship that's now located in Singapore. Uh, my very good friend, uh, Admiral Chris Barry, former Chief of the Defence Force, and I were discussing whether we should be thinking, instead of for the next generation of uh, frigates, whether the littoral combat ship concept <laughs> built by Australians um, in America might be a, a proposition. Uh, the issue of whether it is, you know, the plug-in, plug-out modules are the sorts of things that would be attractive, or whether in terms of the priorities that I'm looking for for the next generation frigates, um, where I think the priority has to be anti-submarine warfare, and I am concerned we've run that down, that that should be the determining factor, and then that might determine numbers and capabilities. You're right with the LHDs, short of using them in some major conflict, they will have enormous flexible capacity. Um, I mean, the very size of them for you know, disaster relief and humanitarian relief and nation building will be very important. My concern, as you know, is uh, it, we must not allow the LHD situation to allow us to become a one-shot defense force in which if we sent the LHDs into really serious high intensity conflict, that it would chew up the rest of the ADF just to protect one of them. It's not a good answer to your question. We've got um, two more questions, um, one over there and then second one there. 
Andrew Robertson of the Navy League of Australia. A question, if I may, to the uh, two speakers. Uh, given the rundown we've had, uh, of course, on the financial situation of Australia, but also the tremendous uh, d developments that are going on in the oceans around us, whether it be the questions of the boat people, whether it be the questions of uh, fishing, of pollution, of the uh, southern oceans, or whaling, or any other of the, uh, the things that are now beginning to press uh, on our uh, decision making, uh, would you give us the, uh, your views as to whether the time is perhaps arising when uh, the question of a coast guard for Australia and uh, get, getting the armed forces get on with their primary uh, question of war fighting should be uh, perhaps considered uh, despite perhaps some of the financial and other aspects which would need a very close examination. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Well, as a relatively new quasi-Australian, I can't speak to knowing all of the context about previous debates on that question. But I think that there, there is no doubt that maybe in the long run it would be cheaper to develop that kind of capacity than to have vessels which are meant to be doing war fighting do it. On the other hand, I think that navies are actually at a particularly good moment generally, and perhaps in this country in particular, given that no one speculates we're going to be doing a lot of expeditionary warfare in the next in the next 10 to 15 years or possibly longer, of making the case that the majority of the security threats are maritime in nature and therefore if people are looking at how to divide up the pot of money, that navies have a very good case of receiving quite a lot of it. From time to time, uh, various of our political leaders have been uh, taken with the idea of a Coast Guard. Unless my memory is defective, I think my former boss, Kim Beasley, uh, had, a, had an interest at one stage. I think we've just got to be a bit careful, and let me stress yet again, I know it's boring, with uh, a country of our limited capabilities, a medium power, which has to watch not, as Richard Hill says in his book, not overreaching ourselves, that penny packeting into a Coast Guard uh, might create all sorts of problems, and indeed for Navy priorities and capabilities. Um, in some ways, uh, we've already started to create one, however, with um, the Border Protection Command run by my very good friend Mike Pizzullo. If you look at the numbers of uh, ships and aircraft he's got, he's got a mini defense force, and, and he knows it, being Mike. Um, but my short answer is, it's all right for America, it's all right for Japan, uh, I just wonder whether we could A, afford it, and B, what it would mean for diverting capabilities of the sort I've discussed today for the Royal Australian Navy. And what I guess might have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Thank you, then. Uh, my name is Christopher Swain from the Office of Transport Security, and we have uh, primary responsibility for, amongst other things, ship security, port security, and the security of offshore oil and gas facilities. So to begin with, I'd like to thank the Sea Power Centre for bringing into the Sea Power Conference questions of civil maritime security and maritime transport security. Uh, my question is primarily directed at Professor Percy, and it's around uh, what opportunities do you see for engagement um, in civil maritime security, but interagency engagement, intergovernmental engagement, and importantly, engagement with uh, those parts of industry whose assets are actually at, at uh, threat and risk? Do you mean how ought they to interact with each other? Correct. Yeah. I think, look, I think that, that one of the things that I hope came out through the, t the overall tenor of my talk is that if we are serious about considering some of these hybrid security threats as serious threats, and government, both government rhetoric and government policy suggests that we ought to be, then that kind of interaction is absolutely essential because the issues that are posed may come out of industry, they may come in a different way, but if you can tackle one of these threats, on the civil infrastructure side, you often tackle it also on the broader maritime side. So and I think that, that what I was speaking about, about corruption fits right into that. If you make sure you have well-run, lawfully run harbors and anchorages, then you suddenly stop a lot of this stuff in its tracks because it's very, very hard to do illegal activity in such a context. So I think it's an essential part of the conversation that has to happen. I'm afraid it's time we have to uh, draw stumps on this particular session, and I apologize to the many people over there in the front, 
in, in the back who were patiently holding their hands up um, for a, uh, a question that I, we just didn't have time to get to. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for an uh, interesting and very challenging uh, set of questions. Um, before I invite Admiral Ray Griggs uh, to the lectern to have the first word, the last word, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I'd also ask you to join with me in thanking the organizers for a, a really splendid conference and for our two speakers this morning uh, who rounded it off so well. Thank you very much. Thank you.